Welcome to Global Perspectives. What is or should be the U.S. role in the world today? For answers, we turn to Ambassador Gary Grappo, a distinguished fellow at the Corbell School of the University of Denver. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Ambassador Grappo. Thank you very much, John. It's great to be back here. I know we're tackling a, a huge subject here today, but maybe to start, you would want to step back and say, this is the situation in the world today, and here's the U.S. role, and here's how it's evolving. But we'll get, we'll get into questions, but maybe just a very quick introduction. Uh, sure, John. I, th uh, I think with the, um, the presidency of Donald Trump, uh, regardless of where one may fall in terms of how he's approaching the various issues, uh, the subject of the U.S. role in the world is being uh, cons reconsidered, reevaluated. And I think that's timely and it's very appropriate for the United States. Uh, we have been considered, even during the Cold War, as the preeminent global superpower. Uh, and that, of course, dates back from the end of World War II. Um, and it, it, it is appropriate that we reevaluate this. What is America's role in the world today? What should it be since it's the world today is quite different. Uh, we're facing uh, a rising China. We're facing a potential challenge in, in, uh, in the case of Russia, uh, increasing instability in the Middle East, uh, a, a more dynamic global economy, more inter, uh, interdependent, especially when it comes to trade. What is the United States' proper role in that? Do we have a role? I think everyone would say yes. The question is, what is it? And so um, there's a very active debate going on, and I think that's healthy for, for the country. Uh, and we'll see where it leads, particularly in this administration. Well, let's go back to the end of World War II for just a minute. Very unusual circumstances. The United States emerges from the war as not only the preeminent superpower, but the only superpower for a period of time. And typically when that happens, the country occupying that role very much takes advantage of, of the situation. And one could argue that the United States in many ways was acting to strengthen the international system, of course to serve its own interests, but also to strengthen the international system rather than to take over. This was an extraordinary period in, in world history, but certainly in American history as well. Uh, we had come out, we, the world collectively, had come out of World War II. And when you looked at the, uh, when, when the leaders of the time looked at the landscape, it was pretty grim. Uh, that first half of the 20th century was probably the most, in fact, not probably was the most devastating in human history. Over 100 million people died in two major wars, not counting the Mexican Revolution, Spanish Civil War, the Russian Revolution. And uh, the leaders here in this country, in surveying the, the landscape, I think very wisely understood that a new approach to global leadership was necessary, that a dominant power that called the shots and everyone lined up uh, had to change. And uh, we embarked on this effort of uh, sort of collective prosperity and collective security. And it had never been tried before. And what the United States ended up doing is fashion, fashioning this, this very complex web of international organizations and institutions, uh, international agreements, bilateral agreements, understandings, alliances, and partnerships with countries around the world. And the driving force behind this was American values, uh, democracy, respect for human rights, uh, and uh, um, a free market, um, a free and secure transportation for goods and so forth. Um, and countries were able to embrace that because they saw the opportunity for themselves, particularly coming out of the devastation of World War II. Uh, the United States could have dictated to the rest of the world how things are going to be done. Are there any other examples that come to mind where a country that emerged victorious from a major war actually embraced and helped rebuild its principal adversaries? I can't think of one. Um, if, if you look at transitions from an established power to a rising power throughout history, the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, some of the, the Chinese dynasties, 
Um, it would be hard to find any nation that took the approach the, the United States did uh, at the end of World War II. Now, one of the advantages that we had is that the established power, of course, had been Great Britain, uh, at least prior to World War I. But Great Britain had suffered, like other countries in Europe, and was no longer could be a preeminent power the way the United States could. They didn't have the economy, the military forces, and so forth. Uh, so there was a, a very constructive transition from what had been a British dominant world at the early part of the 20th century to what became the so-called Pax Americana following World War II. Uh, but um, uh, I, you know, I like to say that the United States did this for altruistic reasons. Um, and there was certainly some of that. We had some very principal leaders at the time, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, and, and many others, Marshall. However, um, we were looking at, at our self-interest too. Collective security and prosperity, we thought, would give us what we needed, most importantly, to avoid another major global conflict. So we, we built this post-war global system and, and it worked substantially for, for many decades. The Cold War abruptly comes to an end, and once again, the United States finds itself as the sole superpower, um, and once again, doesn't move to dominate the world, as other countries might have done in similar circumstances. Uh, that world has changed dramatically uh, over the last few decades, and we're in this challenging period right now. You may want to call it something else, but a very, very difficult, tumultuous uh, time uh, domestically in many countries and, and, and globally as well. So the, the U.S. role obviously is still significant. I don't think anyone would say the United States should simply stay home and not worry about the rest of the world because we know how the rest of the world affects us. But what should we be thinking about for the short and midterm anyway, in terms of priorities, so that regardless of who is president, we continue to engage and add value to our world? Uh, I think one of the things that we, we certainly have to recognize is that without question, China is now the rising power. How are we going to manage this? We, not only being the United States, but the rest of the world. Uh, China can be a force for great progress in the world. It's a huge population, very rapidly growing economy. Uh, when the United States was in that position, we were able to provide the, the sort of economic power for the rest of the world so that everyone prospered. We were pulling in lots of capital as well as trade goods, which provided opportunity for those who invested here or traded here. Now, not China is going to become that now, uh, and that's a potentially good thing. What we should probably be aiming to do, and I, I think we have been, is uh, insist to China that we don't want to stop your progress. Uh, and we probably couldn't stop it anyway. But we want to ensure that China continues to embrace, like uh, most countries around the world, the rules-based international order. Everyone plays by the same rules, whether it's trade, transportation, even security, and a whole host of other rules that have been enshrined in various UN um, uh, uh, understandings and, and conventions. Um, and China seems to want to do that. It's not clear entirely whether it does. There are some questions about its trade practices. Uh, but the one thing we should underscore to China and indeed any country who wants to be a part of this system is that we have a rules-based order that ensures stability in the world. We can't necessarily stop every conflict, particularly civil conflict within countries, for example, as we're seeing in countries of the Middle East, uh, but international conflicts uh, can be prevented uh, if we all adhere to this rules-based order. Um, now, the United States led that, in many cases enforced it with our allies. Um, we may want to look at ways of sharing that responsibility today. And China potentially uh, could do that. Now, we do have one challenge. The challenge is the United States is a democracy. Many of our allies, particularly our most important allies around the world in Europe 
in Asia are allies. China uh, are, are democracies. China is not a democracy. So it comes in to this equation with a different value system. And that presents something of a challenge for us. We did see an opportunity for some democratic elements uh, emerging in China in the late 20th century, but things seem to have shifted in the other direction as we see a trend toward more centralized control and nationalistic tendencies in a lot of countries, including China. Uh, what does this mean as far as, potentially mean, as far as the future evolution of democracy in China? Is it something that is possible, or do you think we're more or less as far as we're going to get with that, and there'll be more expansion of the, of the market economy, but not so much of pluralism and, and democracy? Um, the, your, your point about this nationalist tendency, uh, that's certainly not just China. We're seeing it to a certain extent in, in, in Russia, even some um, heretofore democracies of uh, Eastern and Central Europe, um, and even manifestations of it in our own country. Um, and I, I hope that uh, uh, our leaderships around the world understand the treacherous path that nationalism and nativism can take. I mean, this is what happened in the run-up to both World War I and World War II. Uh, and that nationalism invariably leads to conflict, uh, which is contrary to the principal motive for this rules-based international order. And so um, uh, these are the kinds of conversations, uh, the kind of dialogue that we need to have uh, not only with China, which is an extremely important one, but uh, other countries as well. With respect to the evolution of democracy, uh, it's a slow progress. Having been involved in democracy promotion programs throughout my career, it's very often a case of two steps forward and 1.8 steps back. Uh, it's very incremental and over a very long period of time. And I think, I hope, we all understand that democracies have to arise from within. Uh, we tried various ways to facilitate uh, the growth of democracies around the world. The most recent example, Iraq. Um, we're still struggling with it in Afghanistan. Um, uh, but unless it has that internal momentum within a country, there's not a whole lot the United States can do other than whatever support we can lend if it's happening. Uh, and in case of China, uh, although not a particular expert on China, I will have to say that not is now not a particularly good time for, for, for democratic evolution in China, although I think the Chinese would like to see it. Mm -hmm. Well, some analysts have always maintained that if a country has little or no tradition of democratic practices, it's that much harder to establish a an effective working democracy, and I think we have certainly seen examples of that around the world. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's impossible. As you said, it's something that will very likely take a long, long time. But in China, as in many countries, we saw progress on opening the economy first, and in many cases, that leads to openings in the political system. And over time, um, Again, we've seen that happen in countries that are allies of ours. They were authoritarian systems, whether it was South Korea, uh, Taiwan. Over time, the economy opened, and then the political system opened. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but in China, I think we had an odd confluence of developments because you had the economic opening, which was so successful, but then you had the Tiananmen Square massacre, and some of the early fledgling attempts at building democracy into the political system were sort of stopped, uh, even though they resumed later. And then people wondered if maybe that wasn't the right way to go. Um, so I, I don't, and there were all these hopes about how we start with village democracy in China and then it spreads to the upper levels, but that didn't happen, uh, at least the way people were hoping it would. And, and now, again, the, the central government is moving seemingly in the other direction toward greater control rather than loosening control. So 
given that China is going to be such a critical player in all of this, as you've explained, um, do you see those two running into each other at some point? Or, or is it because of the economy, China is inevitably going to be big, important, and successful, and whatever happens on the political front isn't that important? Um, we don't know. In fact, we, we can probably say that a, a country need not be a democracy in order to, sus to subscribe and be a full participant in the rules-based international order. Uh, but it helps. But the challenge of China is because it is such a major player and will become even more significant as time moves forward. Um, uh, we're not quite sure. And particularly uh, as its economy becomes so big, becomes the largest economy in, in the world, which is approaching already, um, we don't know an impact that would have on the rules-based order. Um, will they still pursue a nationalist path? Because we know where that ends. There are multiple examples throughout history. Um, were they a democracy, uh, it might have a different approach, or it might have a different inning. In fact, it would have a different inning, and China's whole approach to the international order would be different. Um, uh, but this is something we can't impose or mandate on China. Uh, I, my own personal view is that with increasing prosperity in China, and uh, 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 very impressive growth in the education levels of the Chinese people, we will see a greater demand for participatory government in China. Now, how that transition happens only the Chinese will be able to sort out them themselves. But from our narrow perch here in the United States, um, it would certainly help if China were a democracy or at least moving in the direction of more democratic governance. I think another aspect of this that probably perplexes many of our viewers is that China acts in a different way depending on what it perceives to be the opportunity or the challenge. Now China is moving very quickly to fill the void that it feels has been caused by the United States. It's sort of different approach to, to the world these days. But the Chinese approach also changes uh, and can change very, very rapidly. One minute it's saying, oh, we're a leading power in the world today, and then the next it's putting on the hat of developing country and um, yes you know this rule based order that you talked about is important but at times we need to interpret those um, you know with Chinese characteristics for and, and, and this is confusing to people because it, it's sending different messages um, of course nothing remains static and I'm convinced that as we all move forward um, uh, China will, will see both opportunities as well as potential threats to its own interests and will understand that it can't capitalize on the, um, on the opportunities nor can it address these threats entirely on its own. And it will turn to this rules-based order that is the rest of the world and look for support and collaboration this sort of collective approach to prosperity and to security, the same way the United States did at the end of World War II and as we attempted to continue doing at the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, and now this will require that sober heads prevail in China and they will understand. And uh, when they see that it's in their interests uh, to take this approach, then not only China but the rest of the world will benefit, including the United States. And we should not minimize the role of the United States. If you look at all the different factors when, it, when, when deciding who is a, a, a major power versus a great power versus a superpower, the United States is the only country in the world that checks all the blocks today and will probably remain that way for a considerable period of time into the future. Uh, it's just that other countries, most especially China, will begin to check a few more blocks. Uh, but for the time being, it's the United States. Uh, so that makes it incumbent on the United States to make the kind of uh, efforts necessary when it can to work with China and other countries around the world to address not only potential threats, but capitalize on opportunities. 
Well, let's see if we can make it more difficult for you by asking you to really focus on what you think the U.S. role should be, including China, but, but looking globally. Um, historically, we've had specific interests in various countries and regions, but generally speaking, my perception is when we've, uh, since World War II, when we've reached out to try to build this international order, we're looking for three things. We're looking for peace and security and even committing forward-based forces to ensure that that happens. We're looking for the evolution of democracy and, and good governance because those reinforce our, our own interests and we're looking for prosperity, not because economic development is helpful just to the country in question, but its economic prosperity in turn complements ours. And I think in those three areas you probably cover broadly speaking, the, the, the bulk of U.S. interests. But um, is, is that sufficient going forward, or should we have a new sense, maybe something specifically tailored to a, uh, you know, X region or country? Well, all those areas that you mentioned are still very, very relevant and are going to remain so well into the future. We will always care about, uh, care about security. We will always care about uh, prosperity and growth. We will always care about, and that will move in fits and starts, the, the evolution of countries toward more democratic governance uh, and respect for human rights and the rule of law. Um, but there are other factors that are going to come into play today, uh, 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 certainly have already come into play today and going into the future. The role of technology in society uh, not that we, should, we want a management, although there may be some cases where we'll have to uh, because of its impacts, for example, on human life or uh, the environment. Uh, but um, it's moving at a very rapid uh, pace. It's mostly led, at least in our country, by the private sector, and we don't want to in inhibit in any way that kind of creativity and initiative. Um, but um, we need to pay attention to the ro increasing role of technology in human existence, its impact on us and its impact on the environment where we live. Um, and that's another area where collaboration, this collective approach, can be the most positive for everyone. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we'll start doing that. It's already started, but nevertheless, it's something that requires a lot of attention. The whole question of, um, of cyber warfare, cybersecurity, and so forth will require increasing Inten uh, attention on the part of the United States and the global community. Um, and moving on to an another issue, more of a functional issue, of course, um, the environment uh, globally. Uh, there's no such thing as a national environment. It's pretty much international now. How are we going to approach that in a collective way, which is the only way to do it? Uh, and that will require, again, that we have a functioning and effective rules-based international order in which everyone feels that they have a say and can play a role. I think most people probably can appreciate the environment aspect because they see what happens and, and how changes, challenges in the environment can come back to haunt you. But the technology area, to me, appears to be more complicated. P people like the benefits of technology. They love having a sophisticated cell phone, laptop, all the little devices that make life easier in many ways, but they don't seem to be as focused on other aspects of the technology revolution, advances that can lead to more control over society. Um, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the face recognition technology that was demonstrated most recently in China. Yes. Uh, again, but. Um, but, but things on the artificial intelligence front that maybe aren't as exciting as a cell phone, but that really matter. Um, I think art artificial intelligence is an excellent example of um, where we just need to be aware. Uh, there, are, there are many traps as we go forward in developing artificial technology. We have, it will have impact on human health, um, human development, human prosperity, um, employment. Um, another area is uh, 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 genetics and, and bioengineering. There are going to be some tremendous strides make, uh, made over, over the next 
10, 15, 20 years and well into the future on this, as well as some other um, uh, bioscience areas. Um, and this is where the international community has to have some basis, some understanding. Now I can go back and say, but we've done this before. We've taken up these issues before. Uh, and we have international conventions to address various aspects of human existence so that everyone understands what the rules are, this rules-based system, and we adhere to those. And at some point, it might become necessary in looking at uh, uh, biosciences and looking at uh, artificial intelligence, where we may want to have some fundamental ground rules to preserve uh, the health and prosperity of human existence. In light of what we've just discussed, um, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the short-term future for the United States? Uh, both for the United States and for all of humanity, I am optimistic. Uh, but there will be trial, it's a trial and error approach. We will make some mistakes, some will probably be pretty serious mistakes. But uh, in the words of um, Winston Churchill, you can always count on the United States to do the right thing after we have exhausted all other possibilities. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Ambassador Grappo. It's been a pleasure, John. Thank you. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.